Oh you, it's me. Today we're going to talk about Lanny by Max Porter. Okay, I'm not sure really what I want to say about this book, and ideally I need to read it three or four more times while making notes. But not for a while, because I have a 2020 reading goal and a million other books to read. This book is incredible. Rich and complicated, and I honestly feel like I benefited a lot from going into it blind. So if you want to do that, do it. Turn this review off. But if you love a book review and you want to hear me trip over some words trying to tell you what I thought of this absolutely bonkers book, uh, then keep watching. This is a short book. It'll probably be a short review and I'll try my best to give away as little as, as possible in terms of elements that may spoil the enjoyment of the book for a first time reader. It's by Max Porter and was long-listed last year, I think, for the Booker Prize. I know a lot of people have put out review videos of this already, and I'm a little bit late to the game, but I've only just picked it up, so that's what you get. It's set in a small English village uh, and primarily follows the family of a young boy called Lanny Greentree, who have just recently moved there from London. He's a weird kid. Uh, he sings odd songs makes up poetry off the top of his head, uh, is more attuned to nature than most children and just loves to observe the world. He starts to take art lessons uh, with a neighbour of theirs called Peter Blythe, who is a semi-famous artist and a, another eccentric character and is affectionately, semi-affectionately referred to as Mad Pete by the rest of the village. And because of how unusual he is for a child, he comes to the attention of a spirit called Dead Papa Toothwort, who lives in the surrounding countryside, in the trees, in the hedgerows, and who is an interpretation of the archetypal pan figure green man from British pagan folklore. Lanny goes missing from the village, a police search ensues, and the main story really is about the suppressed emotions bubbling up of the people involved in the disappearance, the guilt, the fear, the accusation, the finger pointing within the community, the idea of outsiders against a backdrop of rural England in a state of change, and the loss, essentially, of the traditional English village in the modern age. It's told from the point of view of Robert and Jolie, the parents of Lanny, Peter, and Tooth. But since Toothwort is actually an observer that moves through the village eavesdropping, it could be argued that the whole book is from his point of view. And one thing I think the eavesdropping in this book does so well is it captures the feeling of the bog standard every day. So the book is in three parts, which are as follows. Part one, which is Toothwort's almost voyeurism of the village, uh, the family settling in, getting on with life, and Lanny developing a relationship with Pete. The almost disdain of some of the aspects of the village by Toothwort, the idea that he's been around for a long time, can exert some kind of physical force in the world, and he starts to boil this plan that something needs to happen in the village to break the stagnation, and that the focal point of this thing that's going to happen will be Lanny Greentree, with whom he feels a connection as a kindred spirit. Part 2 Things that seemed rosy are demonised with a shift in perspective. An old man and a young boy being best friends, a mother writing a crime novel which features sex and violence, a father who is absent most of the time, uh, both in London and emotionally. All of these are things that are normal things, that can be normal things and are not especially damaging. But then Lanny disappears, and each of these characters is cast in a very different light. And it really captured well, the high-running emotions and perceptions which would occur around this kind of thing. Part three was mad, completely overflowing with metaphor, a resolution deeply rooted in self-examination with ties to folk horror and dreams, which initially doesn't really seem, uh, when you start to read the last part, like something that is going to fit, but the ending of this book is so deeply satisfying. This is all so vague, I know, but it's difficult to do a non-spoiler review for this book, really hard. One thing I loved in this book was the increase and the change in pace of the writing in the lead up to and the aftermath of a tragedy. 
in part one, each piece of character narrative is prefaced by the character's name. It will say Pete, and then we'll have the narrative of Pete. In the second part, each paragraph was separated by a symbol, and in the third part, there was no separation at all of the voices of the various characters. But, because of the voices and the style you get used to in part one, it's very apparent who the voices in part three are, and who each short flurry of activity is in reference to. Even though Toothworks' perspective and the perspective of random villagers are thrown into the mix. So I think that's really, really well done. And because this book gets progressively more staccato, I was sucked in for the entire last half and couldn't find a page break, really, to even put the book down. It completely had me. It ties into the theme of adults rushing around and being frantic around a child who is living at his own pace and how adults in modern times can often get stressed out at a child who is just behaving like a child. There's a big theme in this book of you never know what's going on behind closed doors, and some really interesting conversation segments. There are conversations in this book which are examined from multiple perspectives, and you really see the disparity in how things are intended versus how things are received, which is echoed in interactions between the parents and the villagers, and the things the parents offhandedly say to their child. So as I said, Toothwort is very clearly a modern interpretation of the green man or pan, who isn't benevolent or malicious, but really an act-on-a-whim kind of creature. And because there's a recurring theme of him being whispered and rumoured about by the villagers, it's hinted strongly that it is belief in him which keeps him alive. He reminisces about the stronger belief in generations past. And I think it's an interesting parallel uh, with the disappearance of the English village that he seems to personify and represent, with the city encroaching on the countryside. And you see this with the dad moving the family out from London, how actually scary the environment is to his partner, and the scenes in nature and the woodland where it spends a lot of time describing rubbish and trash. You see this disapproval of Toothwork of the modern age and of aspects of the village, uh, which some may feel to be objectively better. He fondly remembers periods of medieval slaughter and then gets angry about a jar of curry sauce. And I think there's an interesting thought there of how long is it actually practical to hold on to an idea? Also, interestingly, the idea of Toothwort being kept alive by others is also reflected in his name. Toothwort is a parasitic plant. Uh, which lives in hedgerows and is kept alive. It doesn't have any chlorophyll. It's kept alive by the efforts of other plants. I think that's interesting, and I think knowing the intention behind a name can often add another layer to a character. In terms of nature description, uh, wildlife, environments, the feeling of under-the-surface old beliefs bubbling up, this book felt so English, and it really did capture the changing environment of the British countryside. The one thing I can fault this book on, uh, and there really is only one, um, and I understand why the author did it, so it's just a, a personal preference, me being picky. In the first part of the book, where uh, Toothwort is eavesdropping on the village, the writing on the page is arranged in a very strange way. Oh, let's see if I can find some. Yeah, like this. And I understand that it's supposed to represent the non-linearness of the voices he's hearing, the voices on the wind, but I feel like it could have been achieved in straight lines. Also, the text not being justified, squared off on each page, did make a lot of the sequences in this book feel almost like beat poetry. I love this book. I really loved it. While it's not a horror, it has a lot of the same elements of folk horror that I really enjoy. But I'm not actually sure what genre I would put this book in at all. Maybe thriller, maybe folk horror, maybe even really urban fantasy. Honestly don't know. Super magical. Captured a feeling that was so, so English. I'm going to be thinking about this for a long time. I'm actually going to give it five stars. I'll recommend it to people I know, and I'll definitely get round to it again. I had it for such a long time knowing that a lot of people enjoyed this book. And it was actually when I was shelving this book at work, I read the first two pages and I was like, 
Okay. Uh, ended up getting myself a copy. Uh, really, no regret. Loved it. Loved every second. If you've read this, tell me what you think. Uh, tell me what you thought of the review. Anything you'd like me to read, mention it down below. What are you reading at the moment? Uh, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. There's more coming, as always. Read pretty quick. Hope you're doing all right. Mid-storm here. How's the weather where you are? Um, yeah, thanks for watching. See you soon.